Okay, so today we're going to talk about the rotating momentum equation. This is the first part of a two part series. Um, we're going to talk about some applications of the rotating momentum equation um, in unforced cases in the next short video. But I thought it was useful to break these two apart because they're really a little bit independent. So last time we focused on the hydrostatic balance, which in the momentum equation is a pressure gradient force balanced by gravity. It's a two term balance. We talked a little bit about the fact that um, those kind of dominant balances are a useful way to simplify this overall complicated equation. We haven't even talked about where these other terms come from. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So to see what I mean, this is a really nice example video from um, John Marshall's lab up at MIT. So um, this is a tank of water. You can see the mirror shows you the side view. They've stirred it up and now they're squirting in some dye. And basically what you would expect would happen, the dye is also at the same temperature and uh, roughly the same density as the water that's in the tank. And so um, the turbulence that's in the tank basically spreads out the dye like you might expect, sort of like a um, a cream and a cup of coffee or something like that. Uh, and that's exactly what you would expect to see. This is the familiar process of uh, fluid flow in motion. And now they we're zooming in um, after it's evolved a little bit more to see some of the structures. And you can see that there are sort of plume-like little pieces, maybe some sort of filaments um, and uh, I should have said uh, from before that if you look from the side, these structures would be relatively uniform in all directions, top to bottom, left to right, um, with the exception of the fact that the tank is of limited depth and of limited dimension. Okay. Let's see what happens if you rotate the tank. This is the same setup, except now you can see that it's the tank is rotating. The camera is actually in the frame of the tank. So uh, you'll see, notice as people's arms come in, they're going around and around in a circle. There's the squirt of dye, very similar to last time. But now take a look at what's happening. It's not spreading out in the same way in the horizontal direction at all. And look from the side, it looks like columns or curtains maybe of moving fluid. So apparently the fact that the tank is rotating has really changed the impact of the stirring on the fluid and limited the class of motions that are allowed um, or at least favored in this kind of flow. You can see that there are much longer streakier features. And as we zoom in now, you'll see that each of those curtains is kind of wobbling back and forth with a period that's related to the rotation period of the tank. So you can see those wobbles. It's kind of tilting to the left and tilting to the right, then tilting to the left at the top, tilting to the right at the top, and going kind of the opposite direction at the bottom. But these long, thin filaments, motion that is not very different from the top to the bottom, seems to be the rule rather than the exception. And that's what we want to understand how that works in the dynamical equations of motion. So first we have to set up the equations of motion that would be relevant for a rotating tank. And indeed, they're quite similar to the equations of motion that are relative, relevant for uh, motion of fluid on a rotating sphere. Um, and then from those equations in the second short video, we're going to do a couple of applications which will help us understand what's going on here. All right. So first we're going to introduce the rotating momentum equations. We'll look at some of the implications of these forces in the absence of external forcing. The Taylor Proudman theorem, the Ekman layer, the uh, inertial oscillations are some things that we're going to talk about um, in the coming days using these equations of motion. So, we've already discussed energy, salt, and volume budgets. Those are all scalar budgets. We've discussed the advection term, that is the fluxes in and out. We've discussed Lagrangian and Eulerian derivatives, material and Eulerian derivatives. Tension temperature, potential energy, hydrostatic balance. Now it's time to get down to the notions for the motions of the oceans. Real applications of the momentum equation, not in a static setting, but in a setting where the motion is occurring. So 
moving motion momentum equations. Momentum is a vector, not a scalar, like salinity and temperature. So we're going to need to consider vector derivatives. This brings us to a level of uh, mathematical complexity that's a little bit higher. The equations are all written out in, in both the uh, Wunsch textbook, but also in the Valis textbook. And um, I'm going to get you the I'm going to update the link as soon as I'm done with this to the updated Valis textbook. The older version, version one, edition one of the Valis textbook is already linked to from the class webpage. Um, a lot of the, all of the figures and equations that I'm talking about are actually drawn out of Valis, which I think is a, a simpler version than the way that it's done in Wunsch, which skips over a lot of the details. Um, but all of the equations that you'll need to understand what's going on for the paper writing are all actually the versions in Wunsch are satisfactory just the intermediate steps that get skipped over in his presentation. Okay, so the momentum equation. Momentum is a vector, not a scalar like setting temperature. But at first glance, this equation looks like, there's the material derivative, there's the partial derivative, and then a V dot grad, acting on each component of the velocity. So U and V and W is what oceanographers like to call the different components, or if you're coming from a physics background, you might um, be more used to saying u sub 1 or u sub 2, u sub 3, or u sub x, u sub y, u sub z. Either is fine. The point here is that, um, at least as far as this side of the equation looks like, it looks like a material derivative on each component of the velocity. And then here's the pressure gradient force. Pressure gradient force has a gradient of pressure, so that's a, vol that's a vector quantity in the numerator divided by the density and the denominator, that's a scalar. So this whole thing is still just a vector um, and pressure gradient force is, a po is um, also three different components of the pressure gradient. The hydrostatic balance that we talked about before is the vertical component of the pressure gradient balancing, not the material derivative side, but balancing over here, other body forces, including gravity, maybe some other things. So this basic setup is the Newton's second law um, for motion of a fluid, the amount, it's the conservation of momentum per unit volume. Then you use the conservation of mass to remove the density and put it over here in only one place. This is a tidy form. But in an inertial frame, the rate of change of momentum, which is basically this side or this side times density, uh, and that's equal to the forces applied. In this case, the forces applied is a pressure gradient force and other body forces. But in an inertial frame is a phrase that you might skip over quickly. What is an inertial frame? An inertial frame is a frame that is moving at a constant rate of, at a constant velocity, not a constant speed, but a constant velocity. So a rotating coordinate system may be rotating at a constant speed, but it is definitely not traveling at a constant velocity. The angle at which the rotation is occurring is changing over and over and over again at every instant in time as you complete the revolution of, uh, of the planet and also the rotation of the planet. Both of those pieces have a, an angular momentum consequence means that that frame of reference is not actually an inertial frame. Okay. So how do we think about that? All right, we start to get into this much more complex situation um, where you might have, so this is, uh, you can imagine that this is a, either a point on a sphere with, lat with a um, latitude and longitude, or you can imagine that this is um, this, a point on the surface of that rotating tank it's a little funny to use the latitude and longitude measurements. Well, maybe longitude makes sense, but the latitude, you might instead have distance from the origin. In either case, this is the kind of frame that you might want to consider. So there's a perpendicular distance from the rotation axis. There's a distance um, from the center of the origin, which might be the center of the gravitational body, the Earth or whatever, or it might be the distance from the bottom of the tank. Uh, but um, uh, the, the center where it's rotating, if it's going around in this direction, as this arrow indicates, we get an omega cross C 
omega is this rotation axis. So it has, uh, so it's two pi per day, if you like. It is um, a vector or a pseudo vector that's indicating the direction of the axis of rotation using the right hand rule. So you take your right hand and put your thumb in the direction of the axis of rotation. Your fingers are curling around in the direction of rotation. So that's a right hand rule. It's positive uh, upward in this sense. And at every point, the that this particular point here at the end of C, the present tangential rate of motion is omega cross product C. So um, the cross product, remember, is perpendicular to both omega and C. So you, you can do this one with a right hand rule as well. Point your fingers in the direction of omega upward and curl them over into the direction of C. And then where your thumb is pointing is the direction of the cross product. Okay. Can we tell that that's the rate? Well, if, if, if the frame of reference was spinning faster, then omega would be bigger. So it, there's a, it makes sense that there's a proportionality. If you were closer to the origin, you would imagine that the, the velocity involved would actually be smaller because at every rotation rate, you're at every, sorry, at every distance from the origin, you're getting more and more velocity in order to make it back to the same spot in the same amount of time. So it makes sense also that it should be proportional to C because the farther from the origin you are, the faster you have to go to get back to that point um, at, that you started from. And in fact, omega cross C um, is really only proportional not to the whole magnitude of C, but only the perpendicular part of C. That's the way the cross product works. So really it's omega cross the perpendicular part. So it's a little bit like the, um, for those of you who think, remember back to um, angular momentum from physics, it's like a lever arm with C perpendicular um, from a rotation axis omega. Okay. So we talked our way through that figure. How does that work in math? Okay, so the, if we imagine that rather than staying put at C, what if C is, is moving a little bit? The change in C, which is a fixed vector in a rotating frame, or suppose it that, let's consider it that way. So C, here it is. So the frame is rotating, but the change in C in the non-rotating frame is what? Well, it's just that little bit of motion that C makes in that next instant. So it depends on the magnitude of C. It depends on the cosine of, uh, of the latitude variable. That is, if it was right up here on the axis, it would be zero. If it's right here on the flat point, then the magnitude of C would be having its maximum effect. So that cosine is there. It is an increment in the amount of longitude, this lambda, and then um, m is giving you the instantaneous direction. That's a unit vector pointing in the omega cross c direction. And as we already kind of hashed it out, that is the same as omega cross c. This formula is the same as omega cross c in direction. And magnitude, except now it's an increment in time, which gives it the same units as C because the time here is canceling the um, per unit time aspect of the rotation rate vector. Um, so this is radians per time times time gives you something that has the same units as C. So the change in C is the same units as C. So that all makes sense if you let the time interval go up, the amount of change would go up too. That also makes sense that it's a direct proportionality. Therefore, the change in C per unit time, move this time over to the other side, C D, uh, D, T is just omega cross C. Now, this is an important part of Alice's notation. He puts this little subscript I, which means as viewed from the inertial frame. What's DC DT as viewed in the rotating frame? Oh, it's zero because we said it was a fixed vector in the rotating frame. All right. 
Now let's think about, okay, so that's the result for a fixed vector, but what if the vector was actually changing in addition to being on a rotating frame? Well, then we would just add on whatever rate of change the vector had. So B is now any vector, not a fixed vector. If we add on that rate of change in the rotating frame to this correction factor, then we would get the total rate of change in the inertial frame. So rotating part plus this omega cross B is just like the uh, rate of change plus the omega cross C. And for a fixed vector, now we get this extra piece. Okay. So this corrects not only the vector magnitude, but also the vector direction. Because look, this is a vector. This is a vector. This is a vector. We've got three different vectors that we're messing with here. So that's part of the game. And by this, I mean this omega cross b. What's omega cross b for a scalar? It doesn't make any sense. There actually is no equivalent change for a scalar going around and around like this. The only thing that's complicated about a scalar is you have to keep track of where it's located. So the scalar's position would have to obey something like this, but the scalar itself would just go around and around and around. And it would not change because what's important here, what gave us this was the change in the direction of C, not the magnitude of C. That the magnitude of C is fixed even as the frame rotates because it's going from the origin up to a point on that rotating surface. Does that make sense? All right, good. All right, so if we do not need this correction factor for any scalar, so a scalar would just be that the its realization of its time derivative in the inertial frame, its time derivative in the rotating frame would be the same. Okay, so we have this result for any vector B. Okay, so consider the position vector. If we take the time derivative of the position vector, we actually get the velocity. So the velocity in the inertial frame is equal to the velocity in the rotating frame plus omega cross r, omega cross r. Take a look at that. The velocity in the inertial frame is velocity in the rotating frame plus some function of distance from the origin. All right, that's pretty interesting. Sometimes even this stage gets special named where we call this the velocity in the absolute frame or the frame in stars. This is called the relative velocity that is relative to the motion of the frame. And this is called the planetary velocity or the frame velocity. So velocity, velocity, inertial velocity. Okay. So we've got this formula what if we take another derivative, a derivative on top of the velocity to get it an acceleration? Well, we have this relationship for the velocity, both inertial relative planetary. Take another derivative of that, we get something that looks like this. So now um, this is the inertial frame view of how VR is changing. This is the rotating view of how VR is changing. And then there we need this correction factor, which is omega cross VR. We can collect terms together by using this equation and put the inertial frame minus omega cross r as seen in the inertial frame. That's this term, by substituting this minus this. And then this one is vr vr, and this is vr. So what we're trying to do here is get everybody on the left-hand side expressed in the inertial frame form and everybody on the right-hand side expressed in the rotating frame form. Okay, now distribute this time derivative over these two. And what do we get? We get DDT of VI. That's the acceleration as seen in the inertial frame. We get DDT of VR as seen in the rotating. That's the acceleration as seen in the rotating frame. We get omega cross VR. Where does that come from? Comes from right here. We get d omega d time cross omega r. That's if you take the DD time and hit this term d omega dr, the first part. But if the rate of change of, if the frame is not, rate of change of rotation of the frame is not, uh, is not changing, this term will be zero. But we also get this one more. We get omega cross, what if the time derivative hits the r part of this product? Then we get omega cross dr dt. 
which are are seen in the inertial frame. So GRDT is seen in the inertial frame, which is VI, which is equal to VR plus omega cross R, going back to this formula again. Okay, bingo. Now we've got this complicated thing. This one and this one have a piece that combines together. And then there's another piece that's omega cross omega cross R. Here are the two pieces that combine here is the Coriolis. The omega cross omega cross R is this is called the centrifugal. And these two terms are what we need to add whenever we are trying to figure out what the rotating space acceleration, how that relates to the inertial frame acceleration. So remember, the whole point why we were doing this is that the inertial frame acceleration is the thing that Newton's laws tell us about. But we, for convenience, want to ride around on a planet with a fixed reference frame fixed to the rotating surface of the planet. So we want to know how to express accelerations in that frame relative to the rotating coordinate system, or maybe riding around on a rotating tank, doesn't matter, either one. We need a rotating coordinate system and in order to do that translation, we can't just set acceleration equal to acceleration. We get these two fictitious forces or uh, correction factors for that change to an in not an inner non-inertial frame or an inertial frame, a frame in which there is uh, deviations from motion in a straight of, of the frame conserving its overall velocity or a motionless frame. So there's the Coriolis or Corioli form, and there's the centrifugal. Let's take a look at what those do. All right, so we have the Corioli, we have the centrifugal force. And so if we want to take the inertial frame momentum equation, the, the one we've been talking about with the material derivative of the vector components and this, and we just go over here and say, hey, look, there's the acceleration in the inertial frame. So we need to add in those extra terms. So we get this funny piece where now we have the Coriolis term coming from here, adding on, this is rotating, the material derivative in the rotating frame right here. And we have noticed that the, the pressure is over here, but then there's this other funny thing, the gradient of some funny little guy over there. And then we also have this little NC going on the body forces. So here is the game. This form is now separating the conservative forces, that is all the forces that can be represented by a gradient of a potential, and the non-conservative body forces, those that can't be written as the gradient of potential. Things like friction are in the non-conservative forces, Things like gravity would be in the conservative forces. And interestingly, the centrifugal force is also a conservative force. So what does that mean? It means that rather than thinking of the local vertical on a planet as being in the direction of gravity, we take gravity together with the centrifugal force, put those two together, and then we get a net vector like this. And the local vertical is actually in that combined form. Let's go back a second. What does that mean? Notice that the Corioli force depends on the magnitude of the velocity in the rotating frame. So until we know what the motion is, we can't know how big this force is. So it just has to hang out over here with the acceleration term. But look at the centrifugal force. It actually doesn't depend on anything except for the position of where you are. And so it maybe it's not so surprising, just like gravity doesn't depend on anything except for the position of where you are. It's always pointing back toward the center of the center of mass, even as the coordinate system is rotating around. And when you're really far away from the center of mass, you actually get a decrease in gravity. And when you're really close, you get an increase in gravity from the one over R squared term. Or if you're not moving too far up and down, then you might just take it as a constant acceleration, G, like we tend to do. The centrifugal force is really similar. It's got an omega and omega, and then there's a dependence on R. So 
despite the fact that I haven't even shown you what the form is that makes it conservative, it is something that at least depends only on position in this coordinate system. Okay, so if we have this field that's combined of gravity and centrifugal, it's only a function of position, then we can define a local vertical on the basis of that gravity and centrifugal. And in fact, this is actually the direction of the vertical in the sense of like if you took a mass and hung it on a string called a plumb line, this local vertical is sometimes called the plumb direction. It is the direction that a mass on a string would hang when it's motionless. It go, does not hang toward pointing towards the center of gravity. It points towards this combination of the two. And in fact, the surface of the Earth isn't actually spherical, aside from mountains and things. It's a little bit of a spheroid or an ellipsoid because it is a little bit wider at the equator, a little bit less wide at the pole, because down here you're combining together the centrifugal and gravity forces in the same direction. And up here, you have them perpendicular to one another. Um, so, and actually the centrifugal force up here, because this omega, we need omega cross r, and in this direction, omega cross r is zero. So there's actually no centrifugal force right at the rotation axis pole. So we get different combinations of these different forces in different directions. And so that means that the surface of the earth is actually not a sphere, it's a, an ellipsoid, and it is perpendicular to the local vertical everywhere. What about the rotating tank? Hey, it's the same deal. Gravity is now perpendicular, is now parallel to the rotation axis. Centrifugal force is always outside omega cross omega cross r, always directed outward away from the rotation axis. So the net in this case is like this, and it you know, maybe not surprisingly, the net is the direction that we think of as perpendicular to the surface. Um, that's because at this point on the surface, if it wasn't like this, it could flow outward in response to the centrifugal force. If it was a little bit too steep, it would flow inward because the pressure gradient force from this curved surface would actually drive fluid in and out. When we are in a non-moving, hydrostatic situation, but in the presence of gravity and a rotating system and centrifugal force, then we tend to have a parabolic surface of the tank, gravity pointing down, centrifugal pointing out, and the net of the two being perpendicular to the surface of the tank. Okay, so if we play this game and go into a tangent plane at the surface of the Earth, we actually can greatly simplify the equations of motion um, and get a set of equations that's just as simple as this, where we have F naught, which is the Corioli, the part of the Corioli force that it acts only around this local vertical axis, which is two omega. So that's omega, the regular old rota angular uh, rate, two, there's two factors of it because we actually had two in the Corioli form up here in the general coordinate system frame. And then um, it's a local vertical k hat or bold k. So that's f, f not cross u. There we go. That's our Corioli force, which is a little different from two omega cross v, which is the one that works anywhere in the, in the frame. And why do we do this? Well, we do it for a couple of reasons. One is if you expand this out, there's actually a vertical component and a horizontal component of two omega cross V. This one has, or the two omega that goes into two omega cross V. So that means that there's a Coriolis force in both the horizontal plane and the vertical, vertical uh, latitude plane. So in both directions would have a Coriolis force. They're really very different because one of them is in the direction of where it's easy to move motion, make motions in the ocean and atmosphere that is parallel to the local surface. The other one is where it's hard to make motions because it's uh, cutting through the stratification and it's cutting overturning the motion. 
So it turns out that those two are very different. To a good approximation, we can neglect the, the latter one and just keep the former one, that is the motion around a local or vertical axis as the important contribution of the Coriolis force. Okay. What about all this? So that's what this term and this term are telling you. Those are the ones that are in that. Um, those are the ones that are in the local direction. These two over here are the ones that are not in the local direction. And this one in the vertical momentum equation, neither of the terms is in the local vertical. So all we need then are two different terms to get the local vertical rotation axis to contribute to the Coriolis force. So simplifying, we can go from here to here. And there's just one correction. So in the U equation, there's an F naught V other direction, not the same direction as this one, other direction. This one and this one are both in the x direction. This one's in the y direction. That's part of the funniness of this cross product that's hanging out inside of here, cross product that's hanging out inside of here in the momentum equation. If we go down to this one, uh, it's the same thing. This is, these two are in the y direction, this one's in the x direction. And now notice there's no Coriolis force in the vertical equation. So all of our discussion about the hydrostatic balance, these two over here, unaffected by the presence of the Coriolis force, as long as we're neglecting these so-called uh, non-traditional terms for the horizontal axis of the overall planetary rotation. Another thing that's on this slide, notice that in the Northern hemisphere with this definition, F is gonna be greater than zero. In the Southern hemisphere, F is gonna be less than zero. We're gonna come back to that a lot. You can use the local right-hand rule to remind yourself if you're doing your thumb in the direction of the local vertical and you're wrapping your hands around in the way that that planet is rotating in that attitude, is your thumb pointing up in the same direction as Omega or is your thumb pointing the other direction pointing up, pointing into the surface or out of the surface. That's what the meaning of this positive and negative F being in the different hemispheres. The other thing that you might notice if you go and compare these equations to the equations in Wunsch is here, this form gets really kind of nasty when you use the spherical coordinate system. Wunsch shows you all the spherical coordinate systems, but this is a local Cartesian tangent plane, which most of the time is a pretty decent approximation. As long as you don't go too far in latitude or longitude, um, you don't really get away from the from these uh, local Cartesian tangent plane being a decent approximation. So this approximation is called the F plane approximation. It makes our life a lot simpler for a lot of reasons. And it looks, it goes like this. It's actually exactly the same system as in the rotating tank. Okay. There's a one step farther than that called the beta plane. Beta because we traditionally use the symbol beta to denote one of the key pieces. And the beta plane is what if we don't take a local constant latitude to figure out what this F naught is. I didn't explain that those zeros were, but for this whole tangent plane, we're using the same value of latitude, the one right here in the middle, as the one that we're using to generate F naught. So F naught is constant over this whole tangent plane like this. In this case, we say, well, what if we still do a tangent plane, but we allow F to change a little bit as we go back and forth in this uh, latitude direction. So F naught plus beta Y. So Y is the direction in this direction. And so that means that basically we're rotating a little bit faster at one end than we are at the other end. a little bit faster rotation at one end than the other end in the local vertical. All right. It doesn't end up, so in that, and you go through that tangent plane with the beta plane, you do a linearization of two omega sine theta. So the real F, the full F would be two omega sine theta. Here's the part we just use for the F plane, this first constant term. And here's a complicated thing that is the next term, but um, if we approximate this, 
we can just think of this as a linear function of y, where y is equal to 2 omega cot theta. So we get a linear function of y like this or the theta deviation from theta naught, I guess it's the part that's y. It's really the linear, devi this deviates from this linearly, that's where the y comes from. So why is this important? Well, this is important because this gives us a little sense that north-south direction is special relative to the east-west direction. It's special and then if you move toward the North Pole, you're moving towards faster uh, positive F, and if you move toward the South Pole, you're moving toward slower positive F, lower positive F. In the Northern Hemisphere, F naught is greater than zero and beta is greater than or equal to zero. In the Southern Hemisphere, F naught is less than zero, but beta is still greater than or equal to zero. So this little bit of symmetry distinction between the hemispheres is gonna be important when we talk about Western boundary currents. Okay. But looking back to the form of the equations, they look just like we had in the F plane, except we drop the zero. And we have the material derivative of U or of V. We have a, a Coriolis term, except now it involves two pieces, this beta term and this F naught term. And then we have the pressure gradient force and any other body forces would also be added on if there were other body forces in that direction. Okay. So if we now think about all the motions of the ocean that we might want to think about, we've got evolution equation for velocity, density, and composition. Here is the, here's the force for velocity um, or momentum. It's got the Coriolis force. It's got this, uh, it's got this uh, potential, which includes both gravity and the centrifugal force, pressure gradient force, external forces, the conservation of mass, conservation of salinity, energy budget or entropy budget, either one, both of those lead to a potential temperature budget as we just saw. And you can see that the salinity, entropy, and energy don't have the Coriolis force and mass don't have the Coriolis force in them. That's all because those are all scalar conservation budgets. This one is the one that's not a scalar budget. So it has the Coriolis force. Um, we have an equation of state, also unaffected by the rotating system and these Maxwell relations that move things around also are unrelated to the rotating frame. So the only thing we need to do to get to the rotating frame is to put in the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force. And actually the centrifugal force we're mainly going to be able to ignore if we just go into that tangent plane where the vertical is the plumb line and off we go. All right. One last thing. So we talked a little bit about the aspect ratio last time being a useful uh, dimensionless number, how deep the water is versus how wide the motion is. There's a similar dimensionless number called the Rossby number that we're gonna spend a lot of time thinking about. One way to think about the Rossby number is maybe the easiest way is to say, how big is this Coriolis force versus the two terms inside the material derivative, either the advection term or the time derivative term. The advection term, this numerator, how big is it? Well, it's about the size of V and then a gradient. So that's one over a length scale and V. So V, v squared or U, just the scale of V, divided by two omega across the velocity scale again. So one from the upstairs of velocity scale cancels out. 2 omega is about as big as the magnitude of 2 omega. Sorry, it's hard to tell if this is bold, this is not. And then we have that 1 over length scale coming from the gradient. So here's what we get. This is called the effective Rossby number. And it's, um, or you could have put F down here instead of 2 omega. They're about the same size. In both cases, this is telling you how big the vection term is versus the Coriolis term. For small Rossby numbers, the vection term is going to be small. We might even neglect it and just use the Coriolis force. Similarly, go through the same exercise. We see one over two omega times the time scale inside of this time derivative. That's the temporal Rossby number. That tells you about how big the time derivative is versus the Coriolis term, okay? Take one more look at these. 
what is this two omega times L? That's like a distance that's traveled. Um, that's like a velocity at which, you, which you're um, moving along for a length scale L over that, uh, that time period of the two omega spelling out versus you. This part is like a planetary part, the thing that's going around and around. This part is like the relative motion coming from the relative velocity. So, hey, what this, another way to think about this Rossby number is whether the velocity of your motion relative to the Earth is big or small compared to the motion of the planet or the rotating frame. On the Earth, this is about a thousand kilometers per hour. This is not so big. This might only be a few meters per second. Um, so there's a huge difference between these two um, in the oceans anyway. Um, another way to parse through the meaning of this is to take a look at the length scale. So what's u over 2 omega? Well, that's uh, how far you go in a time 1 over 2 omega traveling in a velocity u versus the length scale of the motion. So if your motion is a very, very large scale, your invective number, Rossby number, is going to be pretty small unless the velocity is so big that you're able to uh, travel along that distance in a time 1 over 2 omega. OK, what about this guy? This is a similar one. We have a time period. This is 1 over, one over 2 omega. That's closely related to the day. That's actually, if this was 24 hours, if this was 2 pi per 24 hours, then this is 4 pi per 24 hours. This is kind of just a number that tells us how long the day is. This is like 1 over a day, roughly. And this is the time scale. So if the day is a whole lot longer than this time scale of motion, and the temporal Rossby number will be big. If, however, the time scale of the motion is very, very slow, takes many days to get there, things like eddies and gyres and things that take months or even years to move around, decades, then this temporal Rossby number will be small. All right, that's it for this one. Rossby numbers are important. We have maybe you have followed the details about all this vector calculus and stuff. Maybe you haven't, but the important thing is we can write the equations with, with just a small tweak to bring along the Corioli force and centrifugal force, which explains the difference between the rotating frame equations of motion and the inertial frame equations of motion.